going to take and uh, take some prayer requests. We're going to take and pray f- for specific things today. And, um, um, you know, this has always been a church of prayer. And I believe that we need to pray together. Uh, and I think um, what we're going to do from now on is um, we're going to take and start out with a word of prayer. And if you're watching on online and you want us to pray for something during Sunday school, uh, just give us a call and we'll uh, add it to our list. But um, um, we need to take and pray for some specific things. One thing we need to pray for is Cynthia. Um, they, um, um, we need to pray for her. We also need to pray for um, um, Tuck's hand to heal up fast. And then um, uh, one of the ladies at Walmart who works in the, um, um, the customer service uh, picked up the coronavirus and she passed away Thursday and her husband is in um, um, critical condition in the hospital in ICU on a ventilator and we need to take and pray for them. I don't know what their family is, what their name is, but we need to pray for them. And Avila, Azelia. So there's um, a little bit of unrest at Walmart right now, with um, with that going on. And uh, so, what's that? Yeah. And uh, so. Is there anything else that you want to just take an add to the... Per- yes, ma'am. Um, my sister, Tracy Ariella, she's having major surgery tomorrow morning. What's her name? Tracy Ariella. Tracy? What? Yeah, Larry. Larry Garcia is really sick. Um we need to take and pray for him. Um, and oh, uh, we want to remember the uh, um, Ariana. Um, Ariana for um, uh, his family, for um, um, comfort. Yeah, it's going to be this, uh, this coming Friday. The 19th. This coming Friday at uh, 10 a.m. So we're going to have to take and get food bank through. You know what I mean? We got a funeral here on Friday at 10 o'clock. Okay. The showing's going to be from 10 to 11, and then we'll have the funeral after that. What's that? Um, well, we'll take and I'll I'll get it set up. But um, we got to take and have a room. I got to have room for the casket come down and stuff. And we got just about enough room now the way we have it set up. So we should be okay. So, all right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to pray for these things. And then, we're, what? Oh. For you? Yeah, Roger, he needs lots of guidance. Your marriage, things like that. Yeah, guidance in that. Yeah, being married to Melanie, I can understand. Yeah. Huh? What? Yeah. And then uh, um, also, we need to uh, pray that that semi load of food that's coming in today doesn't get here during church. They're bringing a semi load down from. They're bringing a semi-load down from Midwest today. So, yeah, I know. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity of coming in your presence in prayer. And, Father, we just thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Father, I just pray for Cynthia, Lord. I just pray that you would uh, uh, continue to guide and direct her. We just pray, Lord, that uh, this cough that she has wouldn't be the uh, coronavirus and that... Um, uh, everything will be well that way. Father, we pray for Tuck's hand. 
We pray that you'd heal it quickly and that uh, he can get the other one fixed. And, Father, we pray for um, uh, Arizona, uh, Air, Air Lisa's family. We just pray, Lord, that you take and be with them. Father, pray for um, Tracy and, and the surgery that uh, is coming up there. And Father, we think of Larry, Lord. We just pray that you'd um, lay your healing hand upon him. We don't know what's going on exactly, but we know that you do. And we just pray, Lord, that you take and um, um, help him, heal him. And uh, we think of uh, Ariana's family now in this time when um, of the passing of her dad. We just pray, Lord, that you take and uh, comfort the family. I just pray that um, you guide and direct there. And Father, we just pray for Roger and that he have guidance in his life. And Father, we just uh, thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for the opportunity of coming to your house today and lifting up our voices in prayer. And not only that, but we just thank you for the opportunity of opening up our Bibles and studying your word and, and learning a little more about what you have for us. I pray now that you'll continue to guide and direct us. Thank you so much for this church. Thank you for all that you've done for us. I pray now that you'll guide and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. You notice I have my vest on today. First Timothy chapter 1, we're going to be looking, starting in verse number 18, we're going to try to finish up uh, chapter 1 today, and uh, then next week we'll be going into chapter number 2. So, get my phone shut off, there we go. All right. All right, starting in verse 18, it says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecy which went before thee, uh, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. There's an awful lot in this uh, verse, and we're going to be dissecting a little bit this morning. And the more I got into it, the more I found, the more I found... The more I thought I'd write, the more I thought I'd write, the longer it got. And so we're going we're gonna to see what we can come up with today in it. But um, Paul starts out, this charge I commit unto thee. You know, the Greek word for charge means command. Um, Paul is, is saying, this command I commit unto you. Now, Paul wanted young Timothy to know the importance of, of what he had told him and what he was about to tell him. Now, we need to realize that uh, if we look back at the personal information which Paul had told him, he told him that he was a what? Sinner, just like everybody else. In fact, he said that he was the what? Chief of sinners. That meant, meant that he was, the, uh, uh, he was such a sinner that he should not be allowed to have eternal life. Uh, then he goes on to say, son Timothy. Now, Timothy was not Paul's physical son. He was not Paul's physical son. But he was Paul's son in the Lord. Paul was the one who had led him to the Lord. Paul also, it's believed, led uh, uh, his mother and grandmother uh, to the Lord. And um, so Timothy was not Paul's physical son, but he was his spiritual son, so to speak. And uh, he's the one that uh, Paul had taken under his wing and, and had uh, uh, taught him how to be a preacher and how to do different things. But then he goes on to say, according to the prophecies which went before on the... Now, there, I want to look at this part of it for a little bit because uh, Timothy was a very young man when he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Many felt that he was in his could have been in his early teens uh, when he was saved. And uh, um, his mother and grandmother both taught him what he needed to know uh, in respect to the Lord and how to be a good follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 
Paul says, according to the prophecies. Now, what are prophecies? Okay. Or things that you have heard preached. You know, um, people say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I prophesy every Sunday morning. You know, I basically I do. I preach. And uh, I preach and I tell you what the Word of God is. I tell you what um, God uh, has in His Word. Now, the prophecies which are being uh, talked about here is the preaching that he received while he was young and tender in the Lord. That's what Paul is saying. You know, everything that you learn, not only of me, but of your grandma and your mother and everything else that you heard of all, all the other apostles and stuff, you need to take heed to that. You need to keep that inside you. You need to take and remember what they are. You know, we need to date parents who will teach their children uh, and train them in the way that they should go um, so that when the time comes for God to call them, they know that it's God calling. You know, there's an awful lot of people today that are searching for, the, uh, for certain things and they can't find them. You know, this is... Um, is speaking of, of the prophecy that um, Timothy had been taught. You know, um, there was a lot of things that Paul had taught Timothy, an awful lot of things, because Timothy traveled with him. And think about Timothy listening to the preaching of Paul. You know, uh, Paul, uh, Timothy had been there on just about every one of his uh, journeys. And yet, um, so... Uh, what Paul is saying here, you need to listen and you need to uh, take heed to those things that you were told or you were preached about. And, uh, um, and then it goes on to say that thou um, might war a good warfare. Now, we need to understand that the Bible many times talks about our Christian walk as warfare. Or being in battle. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verses 12 to 19. It starts out. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities. Against powers. Against rulers of darkness of this world. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. That ye may be able to withstand the evil days. And having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with pre preparation of the gospel and peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the what? The Word of God, which is the Word of God. You know, we need to be prepared to fight in the battle that we're going to have. Uh, we need to be ready to fight in the battle that we're going to have against the devil and his imps. You know, we're not fighting something that we can see, something that we can touch, smell, or taste. However, we are in the war of our life. You know, it's much like fighting this coronavirus. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't touch it. You have no idea where it is, but yet we know it's all around us. We know that. Um, I was watching the news this morning. In the last four days, we've had more cases in the state of Arizona in the last four days than they had in a whole month before. And what they're doing, and most of them are all in Maricopa County. And what they're tracing them back to is the riots and the, the, uh, um, the protests and stuff that were going on. And it's not only in Arizona, but it's all these other states too. You know, people are so stupid. They are. You've got a pandemic going on, and they think, well, it ain't going to hit me. Well, it does. And now there's thousands of people who are being hospitalized for this coronavirus. In fact, uh, St. Luke's up there in, uh, in um, um, Phoenix, they had closed it, and now they're taking patients in, mainly just coronavirus patients. That's all they're going to use that hospital for. And uh, so what we need to realize is that Paul is saying that we need to be ready to fight uh, because we can't see what we're fighting, but we need to be prepared to fight for it. Um, you know, too many times we go into war uh, with Satan 
and we feel that we can do it all ourselves. You know, how many times do we take and go against Satan and we say, well, you know what? I can do this myself. I don't have to worry about anybody else. You know, I don't have to go to God. You know, I'm tough enough to do it on my own. Well, you know, I look at the life of Job. Job was a what? Righteous man. He was more wealthy than anyone in the East at that time. God had really blessed him. God blessed him over and over and over because of his righteousness. Now, let's take a look at what happened to him. God said to Satan, okay, go ahead and you can, uh, you can touch him, but don't touch him personally. So what happened? Satan took his sons, took his daughters, took his house, took his uh, servants, took all of his animals, took everything monetarily that he had. Everything. Well, Satan come back to God and he says, well, he says, if you let me touch his personally, then he'll curse you. He says, okay, go ahead. You can't kill him, though. And I mean, I believe that, that Job came awful close to death. I really do. I mean, you think the coronavirus is bad? It's nothing compared to what, what uh, uh, Job had to go through. Yeah, let's face it, he had boils from the top of his head all the way to the soles of his feet. We need to realize that Job went through an awful lot uh, for the cause of Christ. Now, you know, you know, the more that we do for God, the more of a fight that we're going to have of Satan. I want you to understand that. The more that you do for God, the more tracts you pass out, the more people you talk about salvation and, and lead them to the Lord, the more Satan is going to fight you. He is. That's just the way it is. You know, um, you know, Paul's telling young Timothy that he needs to go and fight as he had been taught to fight and to, uh, um, and to be a good soldier, so to speak. He says, I want you to take and fight, and I want you to fight hard because you're going to need it. Don't turn your back on Satan. Just keep going forward. Uh, verse 19, it says, Holding the faith and good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. I want you to underline, if you will, in your Bibles, um, put away concerning faith, which some, or go to which some, um, having put away concerning faith. I want you to under, underline that. I want you to underline that part in your Bible, if you got your Bible. Um, and the reason I want you to do that is I want to show you some things that we need to be so careful about. Uh, Paul tells Timothy, you got to take and hold the faith. Paul is referring to the Christian warfare. Take the shield of faith, which... Uh, um, we can fight off all the fiery darts of the wicked one. But he's saying, listen, Timothy, you need to have faith that God will do everything that he has promised to do. You know, so many times we as Christians, I believe that we don't have the faith we need in God. I don't think so. I don't believe that we say, well, you know what? I have faith that God can get me through this situation. I have faith that God can take and get me uh, this or that or anything else. What has God promised us? I will supply your every need according to his riches in heaven through Christ Jesus. He says, I'm going to supply your need. That's a promise. Now, how do we know that that's going to be true? By faith. Well, how do we get our faith? Faith cometh by hearing and by and hearing by the word of God. What we need to realize is if we're going to have good faith, we need to be in God's word. We need to take and read the Bible. We need to take and do a, a Bible study. We need to take and have a Bible reading schedule that we go through on a daily basis. You know, this morning's uh, uh, message, um, I was reading in my Bible the other day, and I was, doing, I was in the book of Esther, and that's what the, the uh, message is on this morning. You don't want to miss this morning's message. Um, I guarantee it, because it's a good one. Um, but what we need to realize is this, is we cannot have faith 
if we do not study God's word. We don't. We will not have faith. You know, let's face it. How would you know that uh, George Washington was the first president of the United States if you did not read a history book? You wouldn't know it. You know, um, with them trying to write out the Civil War is the worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, they're trying to erase part of American history. You know, well, then they might as well erase Martin Luther King's march. It's the same thing. You know, what we need to realize is people are going about things completely wrong. And what we need to understand is that we need to have faith to take and get things done. And then in, uh, in good conscience, you know, we need to believe what we have faith in. You know, it's one thing to have faith that something will happen, but if we don't believe that it can happen, what good is our faith? You know, I can have faith that God will supply my every need, but if I don't believe it, God's not going to supply it. You know, I, as I was doing this, I was thinking of the woman that had the issue of blood. Okay, why was she healed? It was her faith. It wasn't her touching his garment. It was her faith that he could heal her. You know, what we need to do is we need to have faith something's going to happen. We need to have faith that God can do everything but fail. And if we have that faith, I guarantee that things are going to happen. And things are going to be done just the way God says they will. But we got to have that faith. We have to have faith in order to take and get anything done. You know, he says a good conscience will keep us from falling uh, in the time of battle. And a good conscience will keep our faith where it needs to be. What happens the very moment that we get saved? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes in. What does he become? Our conscience. Through faith, he's going to take and he's going to show us what's right and what's wrong. You know, I was talking to a guy here a while back, and I said to him, I said, well, I said, are you still saved? He goes, yeah. He says, I am. I said, how do you know that? He says, because I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I said, exactly. Now, I said, have you, you haven't lost it. He goes, no. I said, why not? He says, because the Bible says I can't lose it. I said, exactly. And I said, it's by what? He says, it's by faith. I said, exactly. And I said, you got your faith by the word of God. And I said, what we need to realize is this, is that we, in order to have faith, we need to read God's word. I feel sorry for anybody who feels that they can lose their salvation. I do. I feel sorry for them. I really do. Because they would have to get saved every day. In fact, they'd have to get saved four or five times a day. Every time they sinned, they would have to get re-saved. What does that say about the Lord? He'd have to go back to the cross every time they sinned how many times did he die once. once for all and what we need to realize we only have to accept him one time but then he goes on to say which some have put away now the word put away means to throw and what paul is telling timothy here is uh, that some people have thrown their faith away they don't have faith that God can do everything but fail. And, you know, it'd be like a captain of a ship throwing his compass away. Or it would be like a preacher throwing his Bible away. You know, what we need to realize is this, is that we need to hold on in good conscience onto our faith. You know, let me ask you something. If there's a farmer and uh, it's been dry... And he doesn't put any crops in the ground. And then one day it rains. Did he have faith that his crops would grow? No, he doesn't. He didn't have any faith at all. You know, he's saying, oh, it's not going to rain today. I'm not going to put my crops in the ground. All they're going to do is just sit there. Well, two days later it rained. And there he sat with all the seed in his building and nothing in the ground. So he got no crops. You know, what we need to realize, we need to understand that through faith, God will take care of the things that we need. Now, when he said that some have, have, uh, have put away, 
what he's talking about there is there are some in the early church that have discarded their faith. Now, um, and then he goes on to say, and have made shipwreck. You know, when we get angry and uh, do, uh, do things that we probably shouldn't do, we become shipwrecked. We become um, swamped, so to speak. <laughs> you know, have you ever been in a canoe and um, uh, somebody in the canoe with you leans the wrong way and you tip over? I'm not looking at my wife, honest. I, I'm not looking at my wife much. We were, we were just married, and we did a lot of canoeing, her and I. And uh, this was, I'll never forget, it was on Good Friday morning. Uh, we had um, a break at work from noon till 2. So I said, well, let's take the canoe up, brand new canoe. We just got it. And I said, let's go down the river and, and see how it works. She said, okay. So we put it, and it was cold out. And I had a winter coat on. She had a winter coat on. And uh, we got in the canoe, and we're going down the river. And all of a sudden, I don't know, for some odd reason, somebody leaned over the side. And uh, uh, needless to say, uh, we took, took a swim. And, you know, that water was really cold. I didn't want to get out of it because I could hear him yelling. He could, she could hear me yelling under the water. I was not a happy camper. But anyway, because then we had to go back home, change clothes and everything before we could go back to work. But anyway, but, um, but that's what shipwrecked is. You know, it's, it's taking on water that you shouldn't have to do. You know, when we go um, on spending bins and things like that, and there's no light at the end of the tunnel to pay our bills, you know, we become shipwrecked. You know, Paul's telling Timothy to keep the faith and continue to learn from what he has been taught, and he will, uh, he won't become shipwrecked. Verse 20, it says, Of whom is uh, Hyninius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. These two lost their focus. They lost their focus on what was right. Now, um, you know, they at one time had faith. They at one time knew the truth. They at one time had a conscience, but they both lost what they had and they became shipwrecked. They became swamped. They became of no value to the Lord at all. You know, when we lose our focus, we lose our faith and conscience, then we become derailed, so to speak. You know, we're, um, we are no use for the Lord and we have, we're more of a hindrance than a help. And that's what these two here were. They were more of a hindrance to the furtherance of, of uh, the gospel than they were a help. And um, when people become that way, there's one of two things that need to get done. They either have to be taken out from the fellowship, or God's going to take them out. One of the two. And, um, you know, but he said, I have delivered them unto Satan. Now, when we are of no use to the Lord and cause more problems in the church than good, we need to turn these over to Satan. Ooh. Now, these do not lose their salvation. They don't lose their salvation. However... Uh, if you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you may want to underline this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. I have it underlined, and I've got footnotes on it and everything else. But um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. I'll wait till you get there. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5. And, the, you know, Paul, when he was talking to the church of Corinth, he uh, uh, basically was telling them the same thing. It says, To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the what? Flesh. For the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit 
may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, you may say, well, what exactly is that talking about? Well, if you take and you think about this for a minute, once we're saved, we're what? Always saved. saved. It doesn't matter. You can't lose your salvation. And this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, even if you turn someone over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, their soul or their spirit is still going to be saved. They're still going to go to heaven. But, think about this for just a minute. How would you like to be turned over to Satan? I mean, you know, here's Satan, and he's going, come on, turn him over. Turn him over to me. Come on, come on, come on. I want to have some fun. And that's exactly what he would do. You know, I guarantee that if you were turned over to Satan, that your life would not be good. Guarantee it. I mean, Satan, I mean, he wants nothing more than for us to um, be turned over to Satan. You know, um, they're not, they won't lose their salvation, but they will be saved, but Satan is just going to have his way with them. I mean, I, I don't know how much power God has given to Satan, but I know he's given a lot of power to him. Look what he did to Job. You know, now, think about Job for a minute. God turned Job over to Satan, didn't he? What did Satan do to Job when he got turned over to him? Took everything away from him. He ruined his life. Now, did God still love Job? You bet he did. God still loved him, but he turned Job over to Satan, and Satan had a heyday. Just think what Satan will do to you and I. Now, did, let me ask you something. Did Satan go up to God and say, well, do you mind if I take all of his stuff away from him? His sons, his daughters, all of his wealth, all of his riches, every monetary thing that he has in life. Do you mind if I do that? He never asked God that, did he? He just went and did it. The second time, he says, yes, sir. Because he wanted to test Job. You know, God allows Satan to bring things into our lives to test us. Now, just think for a minute. If you, Yes, he, well, yes, but he still wants to test us. Now, let's take a look. What happens if he turns you over to Satan? What happens? Okay, you're turned over to Satan, and Satan is just running havoc with you. You know, your, your health is gone. Your, your wealth is gone. Your family is gone. Everything is gone. And he's still just beating on you and beating on you and beating on you. Why? Because you were turned over to him. But he cannot cause you to die. Think about that. You're going to have to go through all that trial, that tribulation, all of that that bad things, because you were turned over to him. Now, I, I feel sorry for these two in a way, because, you know, Paul turned them over to Satan. Well, yes, kind of. And so what, what should happen is they should see what they're doing and they should turn back to the Lord. Now, there are many who feel that um, they can stand the uh, wiles of the devil. However, I do not believe that hardly anybody can. You know, let's face it. There's an awful lot of people who think that they can do everything themselves. But you know what? God, if we don't have God on our side, I guarantee that we're going to fail. Guarantee it. Especially going against Satan. You know, people don't understand how much power Satan has. Well, yeah, that's right. They don't, may not believe it. But then look what, it, look what Paul says in the rest of that verse. May learn not to blaspheme. May learn not to blaspheme. You know, the two of them were telling lies about the resurrection. Um, They were saying that the resurrection already happened and that Christ was not coming back again. 
uh, and he had already come. They were saying the teaching of Paul and the other apostles were wrong. They were blaspheming against what was being preached. Now, they weren't blaspheming the Holy Spirit, were they? They were blaspheming the preaching of God's Word. Now, as I was going through this, I got to thinking about that a little bit, and I'm thinking to myself, well, all they were doing was telling some lies. What, blaspheming the Holy Spirit? No. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit, what that is, is totally rejecting the Holy Spirit, not getting saved. Now, here we see that I believe that they were saved. I believe they were baptized. I believe that they had followed, um, followed Paul for a long time. But I also believe that Satan had sent someone into their life that confused them to a point that they took it as doctrine. Now, I want you to understand a few things. There's an awful lot of religions out there today that are teaching a lot of different things and younger Christians who are not grounded in the Word of God are listening to it, and they're starting to follow them instead of following the Word of God. That's blaspheme right there. They're blaspheming. And they should be turned over to Satan. Now, I had a call from, uh, uh, or a text from somebody the other day, and he was going down through uh, exactly what somebody, they had a debate over something, and he says, what do you feel about it? And I came back and I told him exactly what I felt about it. Now, what we need to realize is this. We need to understand what the Word of God says. We need to understand that it's the truth. And we need to know how to answer every man. We need to go to the Bible and say, okay, this is what the Bible says. Now, counterdict that. It's just the way it is. Now, these two preaching falsehoods, were not telling the truth. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, it says, <clears throat> And their word will eat as it doth a canker, of whom Hernidius and uh, Philistus, whom concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So what's happening here is they're preaching falsehoods and people are believing it because they're not grounded in the Word of God. You know, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. We need to study God's Word so that when people ask us questions, we can tell them from the Word of God. You know, there's an awful lot of preachers today, believe it or not, who are preaching falsehoods. They're not preaching the Word of God. They're not preaching what the Bible says. They're preaching a philosophy that is not true. Where are they getting this philosophy from? man's books. I read an article the other day and this guy uh, said, well, I read at least a book every other day, a whole book every other day. And that's where I'm getting my knowledge to preach God's word. I'm thinking to myself, huh? I don't care how good a man is. There's falsehoods in their books. You know, I believe that Ryrie was really a good, solid theologian. But you know what? There's things in his books I don't agree with. You know, I believe that Pentecost was a good theologian, but you know what? There's things in his books I don't agree with. You know, I believe that John R. Rice was a really good Bible teacher, Bible preacher, good soul winner, but you know what? There's things in his books that I don't agree with. Jack Hiles is the same way. I mean, you know, all these people that are writing these books, they're writing them to do what? Make money. Make money. So, they don't, a lot of them care what they say as long as they make money off them. You know, I was reading in uh, Oliver Green's um, um, 
commentary the other night on Revelation. And uh, um, I mean, Oliver B. Green, I, I, I'll tell you what, I line up with him about 80% of the time, or 85% of the time. But they're that 15% that I do not agree with him. What we need to realize is this. If man writes a book, we need to be careful if it lines up with the Bible or not. And, uh, um, you know, here we see that these two, they had gotten off the track. They'd been derailed, so to speak. They were going a different direction than what Paul and the apostles were teaching. What we need to realize is that we need to know what the Bible says. You know, how many times have I said this? Know what you believe and back it up by God's word. You have to do that. You have to know what you believe, and you have to be able to back it up by God's word. If you can't, you better find out why. You know, it can either be, well, it's a falsehood, or it could be that it's really not in God's word. It's just a philosophy that you have or someone else has that can't be uh, backed up by God's word. I happened to see a... Um, um, uh, something on, on Facebook the other day, somebody put in there about something, and they used another translation other than King James. ESB or whatever it is, or HIV, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> anyway, but I went and I, uh, I read it, and I, I thought, man, that's not right. So I went back to King James, I went back to my original uh, Greek, and I went word for word in it, and I knew it wasn't right, so I went and I sent them, I sent them a, um, a, a message, private message, and I told them, I said, please make sure that when you post something, you post the truth and not a fallacy. And they came back and they said, what do you mean? So I went through and I explained to them what that verse actually meant and they were taking it out of context. And, you know, they never answered me back. Yeah. They never retracted it off of Facebook or anything else. You know, this is what's happening. There are so many people who feel they know the Bible. And they don't know anything about it. And they post all kinds of crazy things on there. And there's people that are Christians that much, and they take it as gospel when it's actually a fallacy. Well, that's what these two here were doing. That's what was, what was going on with these two here. They were preaching a doctrine that was not true. They were preaching that the resurrection had already happened. Jesus had already come back. He had already taken the church out. Everything was done. He's not coming back again. But it was wrong. And what did Paul do? He says, I turned him over to Satan. Man, I'm glad it was them and not me. Because I wouldn't want to be turned over to Satan. All right, we're out of time. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you so much for loving us. I just pray now that you'll help us and guide us. I hope we got something out of this today that we can use for our own lives. Be with us now, I pray. Just pray for the church service to follow, that everything that goes on will be for your honor and your glory. We love you. We thank you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to start church in about 10 minutes, if even that.